this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the Crawford family murders? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll start with the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Elmer Kyle Crawford was born in Canada in May of 1930. Elmer was described as a loner and quiet. He dropped out of school at an early age. At some point, he moved to Ireland. His family was from there. When he was 22, he emigrated to Australia on a cruise ship. He found the job as a handyman at a racing club. He was promoted to electrician. He made $64 a week which was actually above average earnings in that area for that time. He made extra money collecting parking fees on weeknights and weekends at the racing club and worked as an unarmed security guard at another place. Some have suggested perhaps this could have been because Elmer wanted to be a police officer. This is important because many serial killers had an interest in police work at some point in their lives. Even though Elmer would not go on to be a serial killer, he would go on to commit a number of murders. I think this is possible, but an unarmed security guard is much different than a police officer. For example, instead of saying stop or I'll shoot like a police officer, unarmed security guards say stop or I'll write down a thorough description of your appearance. Elmer's co-workers found him to be competent, diligent, and friendly. They noticed that he stayed to himself. He didn't ever enter into any type of genuine friendship. When people would ask him about his past, he would ignore them or change the subject. He was very careful with money, mindful about even a small expenditure. In February of 1957, Elmer married a woman named Teresa McManus. They moved into a house in 1958. It was new construction in the town of Glenroy, Australia, which is north of Melbourne. The couple had a daughter, Catherine, that same year. The Crawford's neighbors generally liked Elmer, but they did find him quiet, aloof, and socially awkward. He would not attend neighborhood parties, except at Christmas, but even then, he really wouldn't talk to anybody. Rather, he sat by himself. People seemed to think he was enjoying himself, however. So, again, it just sounds like somebody who's quiet and kind of minding their own business. Elmer was quite helpful to his neighbors in a variety of ways. Even though he wasn't a licensed electrician, he did a lot of electrical and telephone work for people in the neighborhood at no charge and let them borrow from his extensive collection of tools. When neighbors would come over, including neighborhood kids, Elmer was friendly and approachable. He would happily fix bicycles and other items that the neighborhood children would bring over. Overall, Elmer appears to have low extroversion, but mid-range or high in the facet of friendliness. In 1962, the Crawfords had a son, James. In 1964, they had a daughter, Karen. So now three children altogether. Teresa had some difficulty regulating her emotions after giving birth to Karen. People described it as a nervous breakdown. She appeared to be depressed. She was crying frequently and not getting a lot accomplished. She went to see a physician who prescribed her nerve tablets, but this only exacerbated her symptoms. During this time, the 1960s, postpartum depression was not really understood or effectively treated. Elmer was helpful in his response to Teresa's condition. He arranged for her parents to temporarily stay with them in Glenroy and take care of the household. He covered all their expenses. This took the pressure off of Teresa so she could recover. After her recovery, Elmer told her they would not be having any more children. In 1970, Teresa became pregnant for the fourth time. Before I move to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Get mouth-watering seasonal recipes and fresh, pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. Enjoy variety, simplicity, and ease by making HelloFresh part of your back-to-school routine. HelloFresh offers a wide variety of quick meal options, like 20-minute dinners or oven-ready pizzas. It's a hectic time in any household, not just one with children. So consider HelloFresh your mealtime solution for any busy moment. HelloFresh offers so many recipes to choose from each week to help you break out of your recipe rut. 
HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and prepping so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items each week, including ready-to-eat salads, sandwiches, and soups. HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients means there's less prep for you and less wasted food. As a content creator, I'm pretty busy making videos pretty much all the time. So HelloFresh really comes in handy on those nights when I simply can't commit the time to preparing dinner. It's much faster to use the ingredients the way they have packaged them and get moving back to video production. Go to HelloFresh.com and use Dr. Grande 14 to get 14 free meals plus free shipping. That's 14 free meals at HelloFresh.com, Dr. Grande 14. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Elmer stayed quite busy during the summer of 1970 as he prepared to commit murders. He replaced two fuses in the fuse box with normal strands of electrical cable. He had removed the back seat from his 1956 Holden FE and placed it in the garage. This is a small four-door sedan. He and Teresa signed new wills, which left all of Teresa's money to Elmer if she should die. It's not really clear why he did this. One would think that he would have been the heir to her estate anyway, because they were married. But perhaps it was something to do with the laws at the time or in that area. This brings us to July 1, 1970. Teresa Crawford had just put her three children to bed as her husband Elmer was working in the garage. Elmer exited the garage and approached Teresa carrying a rubber hose filled with lead and struck her with it, knocking her unconscious. He then took her to the bedroom where he electrocuted her with 240 volts of electricity using pieces of wire with alligator clips on one end and a household electrical plug on the other. The fuses didn't blow because they were not in the fuse box. Again, he had replaced two fuses with pieces of wire. Elmer then murdered 12-year-old Catherine with a hammer when she was sleeping. He electrocuted her as well, but she was already dead. Elmer then went to the other side of the room where 6-year-old Karen was sleeping. She didn't wake up even though Elmer had just murdered her sister in the same room. He killed Karen with a hammer. As this was going on, 8-year-old James had woken up because of all the noise. He walked toward his parents' room. Elmer killed him with a hammer, probably before he realized what was happening. Elmer put the bodies into sheets and carried them out to the vehicle, placing them where the back seat would have been. He covered all four bodies with a tarp, then placed plastic containers filled with gasoline on their bodies. He had 15 gallons of gas with him. Elmer loaded some other supplies into the car, like soft drinks, cookies, chocolate, and fruit. He had already placed his scooter in the trunk of the vehicle. He left through the back door of the house and left the house keys in the mailbox. He departed sometime around 9 p.m. Elmer drove three hours to Port Campbell National Park in Victoria, Australia, and made his way to Loch Ard Gorge. He parked his car on an access road overlooking a cliff. He removed the scooter from the trunk of his vehicle, placed stones in a ditch to create a little bridge so he could get the car from the road off the cliff, and connected a black rubber hose in the tailpipe to the driver's side window. He wanted to make it seem as though his wife had brought an end to her own life after murdering the children. He tied rope to the steering wheel to keep it from churning as he pushed the car toward the cliff. The car traveled over the cliff and crashed 200 feet below. He then drove off in the scooter, presumably to Glenroy. The next day, July 2, one of Catherine's friends walked over to the Crawford residence. She was going to walk to school with Catherine. Elmer answered the door. He only opened it a few inches and told the friend Catherine was sick. Later that same day, tourists at Port Campbell spotted Elmer's car balanced on a rocky ledge just a few feet from the ocean. The authorities were notified and arrived at the scene. It was getting dark, and the car was in a challenging position as far as safety. Everybody was worried that it was going to fall into the ocean. A member of a rescue squad descended down the cliff and inspected the vehicle. He didn't see anyone in it, but he did notice the smell of decomposing bodies. He was able to recover a Browning 22 caliber rifle from the front seat and a cardboard box but decided to abandon the vehicle because the risk of it falling to the ocean was getting too great. 
Later, when the cardboard box was inspected, the police found crackers, a piece of rubber hose filled with lead, family photos, an extension cord, and five lengths of electrical wire. Again, the wire had alligator clips on one end and a house plug on the other. The license plate on the vehicle led the police back to the Crawford family in Glenroy. It was getting dark, so the police decided to resume the investigation in the area where the vehicle was the next day and focus on visiting the Crawford residence. They knocked on the door once, but did not get an answer. They left. A little while later, they returned and forced their way into the house. It was unoccupied, and all the lights were off. The police made several interesting discoveries. There was blood spatter in several bedrooms, a half-eaten bowl of cereal, a cup of tea that was half full, and a bottle of upholstery cleaning fluid. When they noticed the carpet was wet, they realized the cleaner had been used on the bloodstains. Moving back to Port Campbell, on July 3, the car was stabilized and pulled up the cliff. The investigators were finally able to get a good look inside. They found the bodies of Teresa and her three children. They also found 22 caliber cartridges, rope, two hammers, chocolate bars, personal papers, and containers of gasoline. It appears as though Elmer had used some of the gasoline to power the car, so he would not have to stop during his trip. The rest of it was left in the vehicle so that it would combust and destroy everything. It did not, but that was almost certainly his plan. The car was towed to a police garage in Brunswick, which is not too far from Glenroy. The police went through the car carefully, trying not to miss any evidence. There was a lot of blood in the vehicle. Some of it was type O, which is the same type that Elmer had. All of the murder family members had type A blood. This was long before DNA testing, so that's the best they could do. The police were able to figure out that the car was not running when it traveled over the cliff. The car had significant damage to the engine compartment. The fan was pushed straight back into the radiator. The impression of the fan in the radiator was perfect. It looked exactly like the fan. If the motor had been running, the fan would have been spinning and caused damage to the leading edges of the fan blades. The fan would not have fit perfectly into the impression. The police found another vehicle that matched the one that Elmer destroyed. They recreated the collision down to almost every detail and determined that when the car was pushed over the cliff, no one had been in the driver's seat. Elmer Crawford was obviously the only suspect in this case, but he was never found. In 1994, he was spotted in Perth, Australia, by a woman who used to buy copper from him. She was taking a vacation there. She waited two weeks to call the police because she did not want to interrupt her vacation, and she thought they would not be interested in a homicide case. Maybe she was just trying to win the Least Helpful Citizen Award. It makes me wonder if she ever met a police officer before or had any idea what they'd do. Typically, the police are pretty interested in catching killers. There have been many other sightings of Elmer Crawford over the years. It is believed he lived in Western Australia, where Perth is. Western Australia is the largest state in Australia. It's over 1 million square miles, and yet it is home to not even 3 million people. At the time of making this video, if Elmer was still alive, he would be 91 years old. It appears as though Elmer will never be brought to justice. Now moving to my analysis. For the purposes of this analysis, I'm going to assume that Elmer Crawford is guilty of the murders. Obviously, he was never convicted by a jury because he was never found. But a colonial inquest in 1971 did find him responsible for the deaths of Teresa and the three children. Elmer's behavior aligns with psychopathy and narcissism, which would be expected for someone capable of wiping out their entire family. What's more unusual about this case would be Elmer's obsessive compulsive personality traits. These traits mixed with his antisocial tendencies to create a greedy, meticulous, fastidious, and intolerant criminal. Before Elmer murdered his family, he had stolen thousands of dollars worth of items over the course of many years. People noticed that Elmer appeared to have a lot of assets relative to his earnings of $64 a week. He had expensive tools. He paid off his car. He owned a scooter. He had a camper. He owned vacant lots in Queensland. He said they were for his children someday. His house was almost paid off, and he had $7,000 in the bank. Elmer made extra money through a variety of criminal activity. 
He would steal various items and resell them to pawn shops. One of his favorite items to steal was copper. He would take electrical cable from his employer and he would burn off the insulation in his backyard. He would then sell the copper all over the area to various scrapyards. A lot of people purchased copper from Elmer, including the woman that spotted him in 1994 in Western Australia. When he was collecting parking fees for the racing clubs, he would skim money before delivering it to the office at the end of the night. This added up to thousands of dollars over several years. After the murders, the police would find all types of stolen items in his house, including rope, padlocks, rubber hose, toilet paper, soap, grass seed, light fixtures, wire, plugs, switches, and thousands of dollars in coins. There's no way to know, of course, if Elmer Crawford actually had the official diagnosis of Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder, OCPD, but it's worth exploring this as an angle. We know that another similar killer named John List, who wiped out his family in New Jersey and started a new life in another state, was diagnosed with OCPD. He died in prison in 2008 at age 82 after being convicted of five counts of first-degree murder. Let's take a look at OCPD. This is a cluster C personality disorder. This is the anxious, fearful cluster. So it's in the same cluster as avoidant and dependent personality disorders. It has eight symptom criteria. Four are required for a diagnosis. Preoccupation with details, order, rules, lists, organization, and schedules. Perfectionism that interferes with completing tasks. Being excessively devoted to work and productivity. Being overconscientious, scrupulous, and inflexible about areas of morality, ethics, or values, unable to throw out worthless objects, reluctant to delegate tasks because they want things done a certain way, has a miserly spending style and rigidity and stubbornness. Even though there is some alignment with Elmer's behavior, John List's behavior much more closely aligned with those criteria. Elmer's behavior may line up with the miserly spending style and being rigid, but it really doesn't seem to align with the remaining symptoms. It's not unusual for somebody to have pathological personality features without qualifying for the corresponding disorder. Like a lot of people have just a few symptoms from several different personality disorders, but they don't meet the full criteria for every one of the disorders. They might not even meet the full criteria for one personality disorder. I think the main motivation for Elmer Crawford was money. His wife was pregnant, and he didn't want the baby. She was Roman Catholic and opposed to abortion, so that was not an option for her. Elmer didn't want a divorce because he would lose money. He was unwilling to accept a financial loss, so he decided to commit murder. I think he believed that he had staged the murder in a way where people would think that his wife killed the children and then herself. But when the vehicle did not catch fire, as he planned, he knew he was in trouble. Elmer was probably in the house when the police first visited on July 2. He didn't wait around for them to visit the second time. Elmer enjoyed camping and was mechanically inclined. Surviving in a rural area like Western Australia was probably not too difficult for him. It's amazing to think about how many people probably interacted with Elmer over the course of many years and never knew he had killed his entire family. What lessons can we learn in this case? This is one of those cases where it's not really clear what the victims could have done differently based on what they knew at the time. The children certainly couldn't have done anything, but perhaps Teresa could have picked up on Elmer's controlling behavior. It's not really clear. A lot of people who are controlling do not go on to commit murder, so it's understandable that she wouldn't have really thought too much of this. I think the main lesson of this case has to do with how the police had a good suspect. They were at his house, and they left. If they did not have the authority to enter, they should have at least watched the house. This permitted Elmer to start over, claim a new life, which he apparently managed to do for many years. Those are my thoughts on the case of the Crawford family murders. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.